Hello, this is Mike Madden on The Art Show on Expat Radio. And don't forget to check out our website, expatradio.uk. Uh, tonight, my special guest is best-selling author Caroline England. Welcome back to the show, Caroline. Thank you very much for having me. You're more than welcome, uh, regular on the show, which is great. Um, it is, super. <laughs> now, your uh, your publishing career has gone from Beneath the Skin to My Husband's Lies and now Betray Her. The first two were with Avon Books and the, the third one is with uh, Piatkus. So just explain how the deal with Piatkus works. Um, yeah, so... Um... Basically, uh, it's a traditional publishing deal, which is um, exciting. It makes you feel like a proper author, where um, whereby you get a, a bit of an advance. Um, you know, nothing like Joan Collins, but um, a little bit. And um, it's a two book deal. So uh, Betray Her is already out on Kindle. And it will be out in the larger size paperback, which is called a trade paperback in September. And then it will be in the standard UK size paperback next year, hopefully in March. But um, I'm not entirely sure when that will hit, hopefully hit the supermarket shelves. That, that, right. That's definitely the hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and is this is this some, something of um, a frustrating time for you because you, you can see it there on Kindle, but it's quite a long time to wait for the paperback to come out. I know it is. It is a bit frustrating from an author point of view because um, the, the, they call it a soft launch, and um, so they don't want to make a fuss about the um, Kindle. Uh, publication because they want to save it for the paperback which is understandable but from an author point of view uh, your work is out there and you want a bit of a you know a drum roll I guess um, but I have already I've got I think 33 lovely reviews and um, and it is there any of your listeners who read on a Kindle or you know prefer an ebook download, it is there available to um, get now but those people who prefer paperbacks they have to wait. Ooh, that's a, that's a teaser, really. But, um, it, it's on my Kindle, so oh, I'm ready, re, re, ready for a long flight to Tobago. So uh, there you go, just to make all our listeners jealous. <laughs> I know, I'm jealous too. <laughs> uh, but of course, you've you've not been uh, just waiting for this book to come out. You've you've uh, moved into the short story market with watching horse pats feed the roses and uh, the latest one, hanged by the neck, which is uh, I think you described it as a bit darker and a bit edgier. So when you write a short story rather than a novel, do, do you actually think that actually one of these two might be combined into a novel or I could take this story a bit further or, or are they all just short stories? Um, yeah, in fact, Beneath the Skin, my, my debut novel began as a short story called The Dinner Circle. So that one did grow <laughs> from, what, I don't know, maybe a thousand or two thousand words to a hundred thousand words. So it shows, you know, these things can happen. And um, but these the, my two collections of uh, short stories. I, I've written them in the past, I suppose, when I when I was in the novel closet, when I was writing novels but not admitting it to anyone. So I was writing short stories, and I was going to um, a writing group and reading them at the group. Um, so I was admitting to those and shaping them. And, and I do like that the sort of um, small nugget of a short story that you can get it in quite a, um, you know, a, a reasonably short period of time. Uh, but, it, you know, maybe I should sort of have a think about each one and see if it's something I could extend. Is is that uh, like an official author wardrobe, the, the novel closet? <laughs> It is. It is. It's a. It, I know. It's. I know. It sounds very strange, doesn't it? But uh, I was a little embarrassed. Um, I felt as though if I said to people, "I'm writing a novel," um, folk would go, "Oh, don't be ridiculous." But anyway, <laughs> I'm out of it now. <laughs> <laughs> well and truly out of it. Yes. Um, and I think it's. Uh, it is something that uh, if you if you've written a book and you tell people you've written a book, they go, "Well, where is it?" Why isn't it, why can't I get it at WH Smith, that kind of thing? Yeah, there's that as well. And of course, you don't really know when you first start, you don't know if it's good, bad or indifferent. Um, because I hadn't, you know, had a background of writing. I haven't been on any creative writing course or anything like that. So it's difficult to judge because um, often, um, I'm, I'm sure you're the same, you write something and you think, wow, that's great. And it's rubbish. And then the other way around, sometimes you're not sure about something and, and people really love it. So it's hard to judge, isn't it? It's very, very much so. And, you know, if you read something back a year after you've written it or longer, it, you think, oh, why did I ever put pen to paper for that? Yes, definitely. 
and, and hopefully we improve all the time. But that, that thought does scare me a little bit because does it mean your old stuff's always going to be rubbish because you should be um, coming out with better stuff as you go along? But then if you take, say, David Bowie, um, I liked his early music better than his later music. So maybe it doesn't work that way. I don't know. Well, you might be giving your age away now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm really, really 23. Uh, it, it, it's right, because, I mean, I, I, as you know, I listen to audiobooks quite a bit, and I listen to uh, a few Stephen King audiobooks, and his earlier stuff is actually not that great uh, in terms of the the stories are fantastic, but the, the quality of the writing sort of is, is a bit questionable. Yeah, maybe that's, that's how, how it works. You've still got, you know, the early stuff has great stories and plots and whatnot, but maybe just the writing gets more polished. Uh, which I suppose makes sense, doesn't it? I, I think as well, the rules of writing do evolve over time and, and can become a bit suffocating. So, you know, yeah. so if you if you read a Stephen King book, there are lots of L-Y word, uh, describing speech through an L-Y word. Yes, I mean, I, I get a little bit frustrated about the rules because who makes the rules? Um, did Charles Dickens have rules? You know, when he was writing all the Brontes or... Um, but we do have rules now, don't we? And uh, like you say, you know, you're not allowed to use too many adverbs and, and so on. And I mean, I certainly think you, you need to um, show rather than tell. I think that's a good rule because it makes it more vibrant off the page um, rather than telling the whole time. But um, but rules are there to be broken. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come on to that later. <laughs> <laughs> So, so with your short stories, it's a different challenge getting those into the hands of readers, particularly uh, when you do it independently, as you've done. Um, and I guess unless you're Stephen King, a, a publisher would not take a chance. So in the past, you've entered competitions with your writing. So would you do that again with a short story collection or with individual short stories? Um, yes, I guess I would. But um, I don't know. A lot of these competitions um, have fees, don't they? They do. And, um, and, and I wonder sometimes that, um, you know, there are so many writers out there and they so want to do well. And um, the fees are quite expensive. And I just wonder whether they just go in a great big hole. Um, so I'm not sure about that. But, uh, I mean, it would be wonderful to, to win, you know, a, a short story competition. And in the early days, I did submit a few to um, magazines. For example, I think there was one called Writers Forum. And um, you'd pay a small fee, but they would give you feedback. And that was really fun. And they'd mark it out of 10, I think. And uh, like we were saying earlier, when you just start writing for the first time and you don't know how good or bad your writing is, it was lovely. I loved getting the feedback, even if it was a bit disappointing at times. Uh, so that was worth doing. I don't know if they still do. Well, I think there's a lot of areas on the internet where you can research all of these these things, and there are competitions that are free, some that will give you feedback, and some that are very, very expensive. I just think, why would you ever enter something like that? Yes, yeah. But, and also, I guess you've got to be in it to win it, haven't you? But these um, big competitions like, you know, the Bridport Prize and da-da, that you just think, think so many millions of people, well, not millions, but thousands of people will be entering and people with really high calibre people. But I suppose, as you know, if you don't buy a lottery ticket, you're not going to win it, are you? So, yeah, that's yeah. right. And I've, I've yeah. just had a, a poem accepted in, as to the finalist stage of Poetry Matters. So I was dead chuffed with that. Fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. What, what's it about? It's about the Munich air disaster. Gosh, that's brilliant! Well done, you. So, um, so yeah, it, and and that was a free competition. You, I think you could enter uh, up to three poems, uh, and poetry competitions are probably the most common on the internet. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. Uh, that really is good, and it, it shows that you must enter these things because that's wonderful. Yeah. That's very exciting. Are you going to read it on the show sometime? I might, I might even. I might do that after after uh, we had a, a, a narration of one of your stories last week. We could uh, we could well do that. But, yeah. But actually, okay. because um, because it became a finalist, I had to read it out uh, and then send resubmit it as a spoken poem. Oh, so you've already done that. You've already practiced. <laughs> I've already got the MP3. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, of course, you don't really write much anymore because your your days are spent attending festivals and, and parties and things like that. But, <laughs> And recently you've been to Newcastle Noir and Crime Fest. Um, so how do you look at these? Are they a chance for networking or are they to 
Do they promote your career? Uh, what goes on at these events? Well, um, Newcastle Noir was my first, um, I, I was invited to go along and do a panel. And I was thrilled because um, there were some brilliant writers. And um, there's a lady called Jackie Collins who um, runs it all in Newcastle. And it was a really nice festival. It was at the library and um, it had a really lovely, warm feeling. And uh, the panels were all fun. Um, it, so it's, it was lovely to be part of that. Really enjoyed it. As well as having a Saturday night in Newcastle. <laughs> and, and now, I now know how to live um, on the, you know, on the town drinking lots of drinks. Um, and then then um, Crime Fest, that's in Bristol. And uh, that's another very popular crime festival. But some people say that's more uh, the writers sort of networking with each other festival rather than a readers festival. Obviously, readers were there, but it felt um, very much authors, you know, socialising with each other. And it was, it was really great fun just to see. And as you go more times, you get to know more people. And it was such fun, um, you know, out for meals. And I was on two panels as well, and they were great panels. So um, I met some great people. So it was lovely. So when you get uh, chosen to be on one of these panels, um, usually with sort of four or five other authors, uh, are you at all nervous about that? Or is that just something that you think, oh, yeah, this is part of the job? Um, yeah, I think it's good to always be nervous about everything. Uh, I think if you're nervous, you, you sort of prepare. So obviously you do your little, you, you research about the other people on the panel and um, the moderator and whatnot. Um, and I've really enjoyed them so far. And I think some are better than others. Um, I mean, the the, sec- the panel on the final day had Sarah Ward as the, she, she's a fantastic author who um, writes books set in the Peak District. And she was the moderator and she was so smooth and brilliant at it it was a really fun panel and everyone joined in and um it was r- really enjoyable i think we all the authors we came off going we want to do that again it was such fun <laughs> uh, of course that's why you're back on the radio show yes well of course <laughs> it's a delight talking to you mike <laughs> uh, and do you get uh, obviously you you um you, you're an avid reader yourself so do you get starstruck meeting other authors at these or, or is it all just one big happy family now um, well, I think um, what is lovely is um, big names. Um, this time at um, Crime Fest in Bristol, there were there didn't seem to be as many big names. But I did bump into Martina Cole in the lift, and we had a good old chat. So that's she's wonderful because she just rubs shoulders and chats with people. She's not starry at all. She's fabulous. Um, but of course, you still are a little bit um, starstruck with with some of them, uh, you know, like Lee, like, um, Lee Child. So that that was, um, but he was a lovely chap as well. So um, yeah, I think you still are starstruck, but it's it's super to get to know people a little. <laughs> well, your writing is uh, you, you've been described in your writing as the queen of domestic noir. So we're going to go to a break with Queen and David Bowie and Under Pressure. Expat Digital Radio online twenty four seven. Hello, you're listening to Mike Madden on The Art Show on Expat Radio, and tonight my special guest is Caroline England. Welcome back, Caroline. Hello again. Now, before the break, we, t- we spoke about your three published novels. Uh, the Betray Her is out in September in paperback uh, in, in the large edition, and then probably March in the UK edition, if you like. Yes. So it, it's a long time between, uh, between books to wait. So what's next, and do you see yourself increasing your output, or is it going to be another lo- long wait after Betray Her? Yeah, well, um, Little Brown, Piepitas, um are part of Little Brown. Uh, I've got a two-book deal with them, so um, another book will be coming along at some point. But um, with it being a quite a slow process, I'm not quite sure when that will be. But I'm very pleased that my editor um, at Piepitas has given the nod um, to my agent to submit some of my other books under a pseudonym. So fingers crossed, it would be lovely to get a second publisher. So if there are any publishers out there who want to uh, publish me under a pseudonym, please get in touch. Um, so, yeah, I've got two books that are a series of a feisty female solicitor uh, in a Didsbury office and her, the trials and tribulations. Um, of So there's that two books. And then on the other hand, I've got some um, another few books which are uh, probably women's fiction or women's suspense um books you know they're similar to psychological thrillers but I guess probably just slightly taking a step back um so it'd be lovely to to see those published 
Well, a, a, a feisty uh, solicitor in a Didsbury office. Um, did you used to be a solicitor in a Didsbury office? <laughs> and I was feisty. <laughs> um, not, in, I was in Manchester city centre, but uh, yeah, there's in, I live in Didsbury village and um, there's a, Actually, it's um, an Indian restaurant, but it, that's where I think she's called the, the, the character's called Natalie Batch, and that's why I ma- where I imagine she's doing her work and getting into trouble, and um, you know, getting stuck stuck into various issues. Uh, so they're fun books as well as so you're following her exciting legal cases, and um, but her life as well at the same time because she's she's come back after a break of five years with a broken heart. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so any publishers out there listening, just get in touch. <laughs> um, now, Domestic Noir is, uh, when I read or listened to uh, Beneath the Skin, it is something I could definitely relate to because it was based in the north, uh, northwest, and uh, obviously I'm from there. And I could relate to the characters because a lot of them did the same things that I did, playing football and that kind of thing. But have you seen any success in other countries? um no not not with beneath the skin I've got um with my husband's lies I've got just a couple of um deals one's in the Czech Republic and I don't think anything's happened yet and another um a small um one in Turkey so it would be lovely but I think um that the foreign rights deals um I think they do occasionally come along but they're quite slow to to happen but it would be fun if, uh, you know, to see, I'd just like to see a different book cover with, you know, <laughs> in a different language. That'd be fun. Yeah, I think it would. Yes. <laughs> so you've, you've got uh, three very successful titles out there. So when, for instance, the paperback of Betray Her comes out, will you still get a little nervous around the, the, the comments that you get, the launch reviews and that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, you do. Definitely. Um you know, obviously, we, as an author, you want everyone to love your book, you love your story, love your characters. But but everyone's different, and everyone likes different things. And, and it, would, it would be a boring old world if we like the same things. But all the same, you you want you want praise. Obviously, that's what it's all about. Um, but so far, so good. I've got some fabulous author quotes, which are on Amazon. If anyone wants to read them, and as I say, I've got a, a thirty odd. Um, actual reader quotes as well and um so far so good uh there's sort of uh you know, i'm getting more you know um uh, five star than lower at the moment but <laughs> it, when it comes to my husband's lies and beneath the skin you you get all sorts uh and that's what you have to expect uh you do get some funny ones along the way and in, in a weird way the one star although they bring your rating down and it's a bit of a blow um, because it brings the overall rating down. Some of them are really funny. They're so crazy, they're funny. So you have to look on the bright side. And uh, I do know that you've got a Facebook page for One Star Reviews that's shared between uh, <laughs> yeah. some of your author friends. Yes, yes, it's it's quite good fun. And it's 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 quite a nice way to vent because sometimes they seem so unfair. Um, some of them are because uh, they complain Amazon delivered the wrong book yes. or, or they haven't read it yet, but they will eventually. And so they give you one star for that. It's, it's bizarre, but anyway. But, well, that's the modern way, isn't it? Because as soon as you've done something now, you get an email or a text message saying, please review our service. So you know, somebody delivers a book today. Did you like that book? Well, I've not read yes. it yet. I've not even taken it out of the package, but I'll give it one star. Yes, I know it's strange, isn't it? I, they should just give it five stars. <laughs> <Is it enough? laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give it five now, and if I don't like it, I'll downgrade it. But uh, yeah, yeah, they all start at the bottom. So, all of you people out there who are considering reviewing a book, don't book review it based on the packaging, the delivery time. Review it on the content. That's true. Yeah, but then again, everyone's allowed to th- their opinion, aren't they? And we're, we're a quite an opinionated society now, aren't we? On Twitter and everything. Um, you know, people do like to state their opinion. So, you know, it's it's that's a good thing in many ways. I, I think it is, but the, but the keyboard warriors out there are sometimes quite toxic. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, I know the uh, the author network is very supportive. You you all sort of you go out together at parties. Well, you call them crime festivals, but they're really parties, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> so, is and is this genuine or behind the scenes? Is it a bit like a soap opera with lots of daggers and that kind of thing? I, I think well they do say the um crime writers um, community are nice because crime writers get all the evil dirty deeds on the page so they're actually quite nice in real life whereas the romance authors they say it's the other way around you see but you think they're nice and you know these lovely love stories but really they're 
quite you know bitter inside but that's probably uh, an awful thing to say which I've just said but, <laughs> <laughs> but no I, I don't think so I think everyone's genuinely very supportive of each other um it does sound too good to be true doesn't it but, uh, <laughs> It does appear that way. Maybe I'm naive. <laughs> it, it, it does look very supportive. So, uh, so let's not go down the Coronation Street scandal road. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've touched on social media, and um, there's lots of groups on social media. And I, I often think that you know you, you can tweet your book out there, left, right, and centre, and other authors will tweet it and um, you know say nice things about it. But I often think these groups are just for authors and actually there aren't any readers or fans out there um, have you had anything similar where you think is anybody actually reading this who's going to buy the book yeah I don't know I would love to know how effective um you know for example the blog tours um a lot of authors have blog tours where all these wonderful blogger people they read the book and they review it or they have um, different articles and whatnot and they're an incredibly supportive community because they support the author and all the bloggers support each other and they all, they all retweet and whatnot but I've no idea what impact it has um you would you know obviously as an author you hope it has some impact on sales but I don't know how much readers and the buying public engage with that um I don't know if anyone's actually done any research and how they would do it, really. No, but, I think yeah. if you were in advertising as well, they would say it's not about sort of a direct sale. This is about uh, brand awareness. So you know, if you see Caroline England and betray her enough times, then you might be tempted to buy it. Oh, right. Well, that's good to know. Because um, My Husband's Lies, that when, when that came out, it was very sort of low key when it came out. Then it started just hurtling up the Kindle chart. And I have no idea why, because there wasn't any particular advertising put behind it or anything. But maybe it was just the title. Maybe a lot of people thought, hmm, right, well, I know about this. <laughs> <laughs> My Husband's Lies. Um and it, it, it hurtled along and it got back, you know, and eventually got to number four. It was in the overall Kindle chart. Amazing. And I wish I could recreate that, but I have no idea why it happened. It was bizarre, happily bizarre. But... <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a bit of a mystery as to, uh, you know, how, how you can get you know, so popular one day and then the next day almost you tumble back down the Kindle charts again. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, definitely a yo-yo effect. So... In, again, in terms of social media, and I know you've got a website, but it, but it all it used to be impossible for fans to get directly in touch with authors, artists, etc., because you didn't have the telephone number. You had to write them a letter, but who do you write to? Their agent, who probably gets lots of of letters. Now, with social media, that's a lot easier. So, do you actually get fan mail through through websites, through social media, or anything like that? Um, not particularly, just occasionally um, people will get in touch. And for example, a lady got in touch um, about Beneath the Skin, which is also called The Wife's Secret as a download. Um, and she said um, when she read it, she'd gone through some of the issues some of the characters um, had. And she said it was incredibly therapeutic and she thanked me. And I thought that was fabulous. That was, that was just such a wonderful thing to hear. Um, I think other authors probably do get more feedback than I, I do. I've, I've not had a lot, really. Um, I suppose I'm picking up mostly in reviews. Um, but if anyone out there would like to, uh, you know, come back and give me feedback and chat, I, I'm very open to it because it, it's fun and it's nice to, to hear what people make of what you've written. Um, you know, and I know it's not always good, but it's still interesting. Yeah, I think it is, and, and you know, the, the, it, it makes you more human. I think the fact that you can respond and uh, uh, interact with with people who like your work. Yes, yeah, and it, I've been to um, I've not been to one for a little while, but I went to a few um, book club meetings, and uh, that that was super fun because um, there were people, you know, there'd be eight or ten people in a room who were all sort of looking at you, but they'd read it and they'd really taken everything in and they were discussing the issues and. And it was fabulous what they picked up on. And that makes it so worthwhile because you think, yes, you've got it. You've picked up on that. You've seen it. You want to talk about it. And uh, for the creator, that's really, really exciting. Well, we're going to take another break now. And um, if, you, if you went back through Caroline's uh, Facebook feed, you'd find a very strange reference to uh, a band from the 1970s. So let's go to the Bay City Rollers in Shangalang. You're listening to Expat Radio. Thank you. 
You're listening to Expat Radio, beaming out across France and around the world. Hello, this is Mike Madden on The Arts Show on Expat Radio, and tonight my special guest is Caroline England, successful author of Beneath the Skin, My Husband's Lies, and now Betray Her. So welcome back again, Caroline. Hello. Now, uh, going back to your website, you wrote a, a blog piece on the craft of writing, and uh, there was some great advice in there. But in terms of the rules of writing, we've already said that, you know, who makes the rules and, and why are they so sort of strictly adhered to? And I think, you know, if, if you look at writing over the years, I'm, I'm listening to um, H.G. Wells at the moment on audiobook. And wow. it's a great quality of writing, but the rules of today just don't apply to him at all. But obviously he wrote fabulous books, so... He, he wrote fabulous books and, you know, when uh, when The War of the Worlds was read out over the radio, people thought it was a genuine invasion. Yeah, I remember that. Well, no, I don't remember that personally, but I remember reading about that. Yes. So it's, and, and I think part of it is the pace of his narrative. So that there's always something happening. There's no long pauses while he describes something. It's it's all happening all the time. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's um, horses for courses, as they say. Some people like it to be flowery, long, drawn out sort of literature and, and just appreciate that the lovely language and whatnot. Whereas other people just want to turn the page. They want to be gripped and just turn it and turn it. So I guess it's what the reader wants, isn't it? Yes, I, I guess it is. But his, I mean, his writing has certainly stood the test of time. Very different to uh, to your writing in domestic noir. So, so one of your pieces of, of, of uh, advice is to read out loud, which of course leads us into audio books. Um, now, betray her is is that coming out in audio book in September? Yeah, it does say on Amazon at the moment that it will be out. Um on audiobook in September but I'm not sure whether that will Amazon sometimes lies <laughs> you look no. at it. <laughs> uh, so I think dates can be changed but I would be tremendously excited I hope it is um because it's fun I, I I've only ever listened to the beginning of Beneath the Skin and of course you you've listened to the whole lot and it was an actress who was reading it and um you're just really interested to see, uh, you know, how they're going to shape the characters with their voice and um, accents and, and so on. Uh, so it, it is an exciting thing. So once the uh, once the actress has been uh, selected and you sort of uh, s- sometimes you get to hear a selection to say, oh, yeah, I like that one better than that one or whatever. Is that the end of your involvement in the audiobook? Is the next time that you would ever hear it, the, the completed version? Yes. Yeah. I think what what happened with um, Avon um, is they just sort of said, oh, this is a sample and we hope you like it type of thing, nice. um, <laughs> which is fair enough. I mean, they can't have authors all the time going, oh, I'm not sure about her voice. Um, so that that was it. And yes. And then the, and obviously I've, I've never heard it all the way through because uh, it takes how how many hours does it take to listen to an audio book? A long time. Oh, I think yours from memory, and this is a bit vague memory, it's about 17 hours, I think. Right, wow. But the one I've just finished is 47 hours, so uh, it it does take a bit of commitment. Yes, yeah. But then, I wouldn't think that book was for 47 hours. I know. I, tome. I don't know whether he's ever... This was Stephen King's The Stand, the uh, updated version, and I don't know whether he's actually published that as a paperback. It'd be interesting to find that out. But, but 47 hours was the length of that book. Wow. That's dedication. <laughs> I think you read faster than you can listen. So, uh, but with Audible, you can speed the, the narration up if you want to. But I don't know what that would sound like. A bit like Pinky and Perky, probably. Yes. <laughs> so, um, beneath the skin uh, was was audio book. But can you ever see yourself reading an audio book? So, so you doing the actual narration, or would that be a bit too far? Yeah, I don't think so. Um... Can you imagine you'd have to practice so much and try and get all the accents and and whatnot? Um, Yeah, because, for example, in Beneath the Skin, one of the characters was Irish. And I think she used it. The actress used an Irish accent for that. So I'm I'm very very impressed. (laughs) People who can do accents. Now, your uh, Twitter profile describes you as a lover of nuts, gin and donkeys. Yes. Where does your love (laughs) of donkeys come from? I don't know. My, my my girls always laugh because they always go, oh, you know, if they see a donkey postcard or something, they go, oh, you love donkeys. I think they're just really cute looking donkeys, aren't they? But I like animals in general, puppies and kittens and young animals uh, so, and just donkeys. A baby donkey is so cute. Well, next time you're up this way, there's a donkey sanctuary in Dove Holes. 
Ah, oh, right. Good to know. Can't bring on home though. That's a trouble. <laughs> no, no, you're not allowed to take them home. No. Now, of latest news. Um, we were discussing the last time we spoke about uh, cereal bars, and the latest key ingredient in cereal bars I can reveal is evaporated milk. Oh. So a friend of mine made them with condensed milk, and it was yes. way too sweet. So I, I substituted that for evaporated milk, and it just makes them a little bit more chewy. But that that's quite runny, though, isn't it? It is, but um, by the time it's cooked, um, it by the time it's baked in the oven, it solidifies, but it is quite chewy, as opposed to without that, where it can become quite crumbly. Right. I'm on the job, but that sounds lovely. <laughs> And it's cheaper than condensed milk because that's really quite expensive, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, condensed milk is, you know, it's that sort of really sugary thick stuff, whereas I think evaporated is cheaper. It, uh, yeah, and evaporated is unsweetened. Right. We used to have on bananas as children. <laughs> bananas and evaporated milk. We loved it. <laughs> bananas and sugar and evaporated milk, I can yeah, remember. Yeah, probably some sugar as well. Got to have your sugar fix. Yes. <laughs> So coming back to your uh, your writing career, um, th- three books and two sh- collections of short stories. Can we expect any more short story collections or do you think you might start writing those again uh, to try and get them out there? I, I have a few more short stories um, that I've already written. Um, so I've probably got half half a collection. So maybe I should at some stage, but I'm a bit obsessed by novels. I can't help it now. Every time I think I'm, I'm finishing one, at, I've finished one at the moment, which I've called 13 because it's my 13th novel. And um, I've just literally today gone through the second draft just to read it through, see if it makes sense. And already I'm thinking, oh, oh, you know, what what should I do next sort of thing? Whereas maybe I should just go for the, the smaller, quicker fix of short stories. But I do, I, I love the whole novel thing. I don't know why. There's no one out of the closet. There's no stopping me. <laughs> so so 13 novels, it is quite an achievement to get to that that milestone, but... Have you got any lurking away on your desktop or maybe in a drawer that you think that's never going to see the light of day? Well, I think that that I don't think all 13 would ever see the light of day. I'd love them to, or I'd love to be able to work on them. I, I feel, um, you know, at least if someone could say, oh, well, this has potential, but you could do this or that, because I don't, it's, I don't like waste. It's this old fashioned thing of not liking waste. But, and I'm sure all the writers out there feel the same. If you've got something, it's such a, ways to have it just on your laptop or your computer and never do anything which is I guess why I went for the short story collections just to make them live yeah and I think as well it, the, the writing you know, maybe in the early days the writing might not be great but it's the idea that you're trying to sell so maybe a, 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 an edit or a rewrite or a complete restructure who knows yes yeah and as you say it might might prompt an idea for something longer because I yeah. think that's what's happened to you, isn't it? Your short story is becoming a very long short story. Yes, they're moving towards novella territory, and I'm, I'm dreading the fact when it gets to sort of 30,000 words, does it then start creeping its way to 70,000 words? Who knows? Yeah, you could end up with 47 hours of uh, audio. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd, have, I'd have given up by then. <laughs> so you live in uh, Dinsby Village, as you say, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice part of the world because you do get the village, but it's also quite... Um, it's more of a town than a village, but you're not far from the the River Mersey and and all the the wildlife and the sort of pastures around there. So what's the what's the River Mersey like these days? Because I can remember it being an awful place. Well, it's funny. Yeah, I've heard this, and, and funnily now, my husband and I were out last night, and and he was talking to the other chap about um, you know shopping trolleys and things like that. But in our little section, it's lovely actually. Um, you know, it's really nice. And there's, we look out for the heron. There's a resident heron. So give it a little wave. Um, and it is lovely. But part of the um, the river path is um, they've put so much sand in it, you can hardly walk. <laughs> you know, it's like being on a really, uh, you know, a beach in the Caribbean for a oh. little stretch. But <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, our our part of the River Mersey is like the Caribbean. <laughs> I find that so hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> well we're we're sort of running out of time now so um before we go just tell the listeners where they can find out more about you and your books and your website and everything else okay so my website is www.carolineenglandauthor.co.uk and that has um, my books on it and whatnot but an easy 
an easy one. Just Google me. <laughs> That's an easy way. Or I'll go on Amazon and it has all my books listed on Amazon and they're all available. So there is um, Beneath the Skin, uh, which is also known as The Wife's Secret. Then there's My Husband's Lies. Then there's Betray Her. And there's my two short story collections, Watching Horse Pats Feed the Roses and Hanged by the Neck. And they're all there on Amazon. Wonderful. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Kaz England. At Kaz England. Yes. And I'm also on Facebook as well. And it's Caroline England Author on Facebook. Fantastic. So hopefully uh, you'll, you will, you'll come back on in September when we see the paperback hit the shelves. Yeah. Th- that paperback will be out in Australia. Is that right? Yes. It's, it's, for some reason, the, um, it was the same with um, the Canadian market for My Husband's Lies. They, they read bigger books than us. Um, so yeah, Australia, New Zealand, it's the, it's called a trade paperback size. So it's the size of a hardback, but it's paperback. Um, right. but it's, it's quite good for, for those of us that are having that old eye trouble. It's quite nice because it's slightly bigger print. <laughs> and will you get, will you get copies of that book being that it's, it's for the a different market? I hope so. I definitely hope so. And, and you will be able to buy it. If anyone, the, the, the downside for anyone who would like to buy my book in September is because it's a bigger size, it's slightly more expensive, but it will be available to buy um, from Amazon at the sort of twelve ninety nine price. It might be slightly less as opposed to the seven ninety nine price. So it's just a price question, really. But I think, um, you know, the prices do fluctuate. So um, in fact, at the moment, My Husband's Lies is on Amazon for only £2 the paperback so if anyone fancies a bargain two pounds at the moment that's good isn't it you'd be mad not to get on amazon <laughs> right this minute uh it's been fantastic talking to you as ever um and you can you can come back and promote betray her again in september and perhaps tell us what your latest book will be called oh that would be fun thank you now we talked about your sweet home in didsbury we're going to play out with lynn and skinnard and sweet home alabama you're tuned in to expat radio this is Mike Madden on the Art Show on Expat Radio. And don't forget to visit our website, expatradio.uk. Now, after a great response last week, we've got Ollie back on again to read another short story, this time Reflection. Reflection. I sit here reflecting, musing on what has passed. Happy times, sad times, and times that should not be forgotten nor forgiven. That window, an eye to the world outside. Golden shards of sunlight separated, falling on the dancing dust as children laugh and bounce on grandma's bed. Their faces alive with innocent joy. Red cheeks and rolling tears. Is it the flu? No. It is the breathless child, carefree and filled with fun. I would have laughed with them, but... That was not my place. My silent world could only see their wonder. Back then, Mr Thomas would clean the outside panes, peering in as he did so. A wave, a blank look, a soapy streaked finish that sent those golden shards into a frenzy. Inside, your beloved wife scrubbed and polished. No rainbows for her. She would not abide a half-hearted task so carelessly rushed. Where did it all change? She grew old, infirm, frail. The window became her challenge, as grime edged upwards in accusing fingers. Black, speckled stains, dull but inevitable, dark green mould. After a while, Mr Thomas stopped too. What is the point of cleaning just one side of the window? Grandma's bed was lifeless, save for the laboured breaths as her struggle to fill those sickly lungs pushed her towards the edge. My eyes grew old too. Misty moments. Movements flickering at the edge of me. Ah, I've seen so many things, yes. Even through the dust I have seen oh so many things. The morning sun is not so bright now. Grey gloom on a sunny day. Shadows dance in the dark when the rain patters on the pane. Each passing hour, each passing day, the darkness grows. A cancer in the room where once was light. Carol? Yes, Carol. That was her name. I could not hear you call it, but I could see it. 
was on a card, or maybe a letter. Her parted lips as she read the words turned that loving face into a funfair of upward curves and rare treats. Those eyes. Especially those eyes. As round as moons and with a smile all their own. Age saddened those times and dulled those eyes. Until death do us part, you promised. It was a mercy when the end came. Natural causes, the doctor wrote, scratching his pen on unsteady paper. The policeman removed his hat and held it close to his chest. His head bowed as he gave Carol, or the frail and lifeless body that used to be Carol, a final nod of respect. But what about you, Johnny boy? I know your name too. I saw a shirt emblazoned with your name. Until death do us part, Johnny boy. You comforted your sweet Carol, laid her head on that soft, comforting, quilted pillow. Your daughter, Beth, I read her name too, saw Carol for the last time on Sunday, saw that soothing pillow for the last time on Sunday, although a casual glance amongst the grief was all she held. Now, where is that pillow, Johnny boy? No one knows about the pillow, do they, Johnny boy? No one but me. I watched you look at Carol. Her sleeping eyes saw nothing, knew nothing. Her gaunt face beckoned to you, begged you, and you were happy to oblige. I watched you take that unlikely murder weapon and place it oh so gently over her mouth and nose, stifling, suffocating, bleeding the last whispers of her life until none remained. Her strength gone. Her arms lay limp as her fingers flickered, fading signs of life. Her feet barely twitching. Her body too weak to protest. Oh yes, Johnny boy. It was mercifully quick in the end. That pillow, Johnny boy. You are safe now that pillow was gone. Carol has been laid to rest. Oh yes, Johnny boy. You laid her to rest. But can you look at her grave? Can you look at me? Can you look at yourself in the mirror? And that was Ollie reading Reflection. If you want him to read one of your short stories live on air, just let us know. Now, did you see Reflection in the mirror? Well, we're going to play it with Human League and Mirror Man. You're listening to Expat Radio. You're listening to Expat Radio, beaming out across France and around the world. <laughs> 